by making the wildest, most colorful people we could and making it hard to be like, every something interesting is happening constantly. Where do I even want to direct my attention? That's the tricky bit. But I also think that's the genius of it because you'll be able to consume these stories again and again and again and see something different every time. Hi, V-Dave. It's great to meet you. Hello. I love your D&D stuff. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Huge fan. Yeah. And um, I found out recently that I actually almost ran into you because I was at the uh, 4DX D&D screening. That was the early screening. Yeah. I was and my there. friend, yeah, my friend who was running it, he's like, V-Dave was there. I'm like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> we missed yeah. that. Yeah, a lot was happening that night. No, I, I, I was I was the giant person down near the front. So yeah, yeah, it was a good time. That was uh, uh, the second time I'd gotten to see it. But when I had the chance to see it in 4D, I for sure was like, yeah, I got to do that. So. so with Foul Play, how was this project pitched to you? And like, how did you get involved in it? Because it's so unique. It is very unique. Um, Andrew Barth Feldman and uh, Andrew Bonello uh, I always say always say Alex's name wrong. Uh, so uh, sorry, Alex. Uh, reached out some time ago. We wrote this a while ago. Uh, just saying kind of like, hey, we're fans of your stuff. Um, we want to talk to you about something that we have in mind. And it was funny because, of course, both of them are huge in Broadway. Uh, but I'm not a Broadway guy. So I think at first they were like, it's us. And I'm like, nice to meet you. You know, what I, mean? <laughs> I mean, I've since come to appreciate them both as people and, you know, for their numerous accomplishments. But at one point, like Alex went just got his Tony and he's like, I'm like, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure you're a lovely performer, Alex. Yeah. Uh, but it just they, they had an idea that they wanted to do a kind of um, streaming adjacent kind of narrative. I know Andrew had done. um something similar once before on a smaller scale and wanted to kind of try and take it up a notch. I knew I had some experience with streaming and storytelling and, you know, I was one of the people to have to do it. It's such an interesting concept with the like improvisation mixed with the writing. How exactly did that writing process work knowing how much the actors were going to actually like improvise? Andrew Brennan Lee Mulligan in uh, RT, whose name I won't even try because I know I will mess it up. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and I would all get together and it was basically like every day we would just kind of like kick around a couple of ideas and then we'd seize on one and we'd see that one through to the finish. So it wasn't like, you know, we had, we, we brainstormed a list of 10 ideas and which one do we want to work on today? It's like, it wasn't like that at all. It was sort of like, oh, it'd be neat if, uh, if it were this kind of thing or this kind of thing, and then we'd have it and we just sort of like continue uh, fleshing it out. And so what we had is almost every time is we came up first with sort of the genre of the thing. Yeah. Like we knew we wanted to do the very traditional murder mystery, you know, the lights go out, the lights come up, someone's dead. Ah, you know, definitely wanted to do that. We wanted to do our, um, our, our nod to like the noir genre, which was uh, the, the, the cubic zirconia hawk type thing. Yeah. But then kind of after that, it was like, well, now how do we do not that? You know, like how do we push it each one further and further uh, to, to make it more and more interesting? So we'd come up with the situation. Um, then we almost always came up with the crime, you know, like who, who dies and who actually did it. Like, let's just get to that in advance and then kind of fleshed out the rest of it. And a part of the process was every time we would do one, when we would meet again to read the next, or to write the next one, the first thing we did was go back to the previous session and look at it again. Like what makes sense? Where's there a hole? Where's there something that we didn't think of type thing? Yeah. Um, which would come up a lot because when you're just riffing, riffing, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, it's like, well, if, uh, I don't know if if we make the key story point that uh, someone is diabetic, um, but somewhere else that same person is violently allergic to insulin or something. You know what I mean? We're like, well, well, that didn't make sense. We gotta we gotta patch that up. Um, but in terms of what it was like writing for people that were gonna improv, it's not so different than like normal screenwriting in in television. In that. Um, I'm used to the words I write are going to come out in a different way through somebody else's interpretation. Mm -hmm. But what we gave the actors was more, more bullet points, you know, like you're this character, 
uh, you're here because you want to accomplish this. Uh, maybe you did the murder, you know, um, and, uh, you know, like you're, you're definitely mad at that guy, but in love with that guy type thing. Yeah. And yeah. So you did create the characters kind of at, at least as a starting point for them. Yes, we did. We did. We definitely um, it, at least had the uh, the archetypes, you know, as I, as I actually see who was cast in some of the roles. It's really fantastic the way they took some of the things that we intended and turned it on its head. Um, but yeah, we did. We did create them all. And I do because I love how much you guys play with tropes, like be it that really traditional, the lights go out now it's someone's dead or like even the characters themselves, like the cult stuff was hilarious because like cults as a concept terrifying this one specifically ridiculous hey we don't know that henry winkler's not god i'm just saying <laughs> I mean, have, have we checked that's you fair <laughs> let us let us all say hey you know? <laughs> you know i don't even remember how we arrived at that one because that was the first one the first one that we did too there were there were so many of these ideas like i, I went back and I, I checked our notes for these because you know we, we wrote these some time ago yeah. um and there were many places where we just like had a direct quote from somebody like one uh it was a uh, the Chekhov's gun of cannibalism Andrew Buff Feldman <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> we just like take a line like that and be like great now we gotta we gotta do something with that so I think it was because we we knew we wanted them to be funny also so it's like what's just the most ridiculous thing you know that, that people could actually be uh you know cultists about and like real true believers of <laughs> Can you talk to me a little bit about like playing with tropes like that, be it in foul play or even just in your other areas of storytelling? Because I think it's one of the most fascinating things to me when people take these very traditional like tropes and archetypes and really just kind of mess with them enough where they're recognizable, but you're still going to be surprised. Ideally, when you get to the ending of something, it is simultaneously inevitable, but surprising, you know? Yeah. Um, so if you... Um, in a thing like this, for instance, if you introduce the butler, of course, all eyes are going to be on the butler, you know, <laughs> so so now you have to do something innately ridiculous with that, because it's, uh, if you if you do something that is too ingenious, like I, I whatever you think of J.K. Rowling now, you know, back during the Harry Potter times, when I was reading those books, I was never even trying to figure out what happened because it's like, oh, the killer's an invisible goblin that walks through walls. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course that's what happened. You know, who doesn't know that? Right. Um, whereas with this, we, we wanted you to have all of the necessary pieces in place to be able to figure out what's going on. The trick to it, the game, is do you follow the right characters do you follow the right uh path of the uh of, of the of the evidence you know and, and put together the the who what when where and why so by making the wildest most colorful people we could and making it hard to be like every something interesting is happening constantly where do i even want to direct my attention that's the tricky bit but i also think that's the genius of it because you'll be able to consume these stories again and again and again and see something different every time yeah like that i can tell you right now i did not solve it because i fully just followed the people that i found hilarious <laughs> 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 i like was going into it i'm like i'm gonna solve the case and immediately it was like what is with this person i have to see what's going on they're dancing <laughs> like so i was so much fun for that but yeah talk to me a little bit about like creating that environment where you have to drop these clues, but you're also almost doing a magic trick where it's like, yeah, but look over here. I wasn't there for the filming, but I was there for the for the strategy and, and the conceptual thing of it. And mm -hmm. in my understanding of just what they knew is, is the story is roughly broken in half, you know, and you kind of have 90 real time minutes with kind of two 45 minute chunks. And it was just sort of like, hey, sometime in this half, get across X, you know? <laughs> Get, get across that you were outside smoking at 11 o'clock, you know, make sure you light a cigarette standing next to a clock, <laughs> you know, so that that clue is in the story. Um, and beyond that, they were just, it was a living, breathing thing. Like I watched how many times they were cracking each other up and stuff uh, with their one shots and things all the way down to the big reveal, you know, with uh, Andrew trying to get it out. Um, it, it was, it was, uh, it ends up being 
very fun and organic that way. Like I, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, make sure you go in this room, you know, mm -hmm. make sure you go over to the door and open the door and you follow her into the door. It, like it wasn't that at all. They're just doing things uh, and they're all pros, you know, so they understanding that I've got to get this thing across, you know, I will, but when and how and in how ridiculous of a way, the answer is very ridiculous, <laughs> basically. Yes. And you've worked with Brennan a few times on different things. Did it help having that like established rapport with him when brainstorming and working on these concepts? It did, but uh, Brennan Lee Mulligan is just the best person. Like however good a guy you think he is, like he's a better guy. So, uh, I mean, even if I, and I feel the same about Andrew now uh, that, uh, cause I hadn't worked with Andrew, you know, um, I hadn't, I hadn't worked with Artie either. Uh, so Yes, on the one hand, I think the fact that we kind of spoke each other's language was good, mm -hmm. but he's such a pro and so accessible. I think it probably would have flowed like the same, uh, even even if we didn't, you know. Um, I think it was useful, though, that he's got such a strong improv background. It's funny, it's like there were, there were like different things that, that everybody had in common. Like he's got a strong improv background. Artie's got a strong improv background. He and I do a lot of tabletop and in D and D and streaming. Uh, you know, Andrew is the, the, the stage performer. Um, and all that has a lot of experience with the storytelling and the writing. So it's like, every, it was like, there was two hooks for everybody, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and it all came together because I, we definitely did some things in those stories that if I had been left to my own devices, like would not have happened. <laughs> it was out of that specific alchemy of kicking around ideas. Uh, that was really fantastic. And how did your like tabletop experience kind of come into play? Cause it almost made me think of that D and D aspect where it's like, you have a DM who has sort of roughly planned out the world and the story and then you have the players come in and they're like cool we're gonna do what we want though yeah kind of to tell you the truth it's um we had a little firmer um guardrails in that you know this is definitely who got killed and this is definitely yeah. who killed them you know it's like uh there, there's not a lot of narrative wiggle room in there it's just all of this part in the middle uh is the fun part um so I, I think it was less about what are you going to do and more about how are you going to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, um, you know, you look, you look at an episode, like an old episode of Star Trek or even something more, more time dependent, you know, or, or, or more, more culturally relevant to the kids, like the Mandalorian, you know, Din and Grogu go on a mission. It's like, you don't think they're going to die. It's about how are they going to get out of this? Like, no matter how dire the circumstances, you're like, oh, well, unless this is the season finale or something, and we know there's no more episode. Like, if it's episode four, they're going to make it. Right. How are they going to make it? You know, um, I think that's kind of it with this. You know, it's like we're, we're going to find out who the murderer is and the murderer is in this room, you know, but it's how are we going to find out? And I will tell you also, the... We, we we worked really hard because once we'd done kind of the first two, the first two were fairly, fairly traditional whodunits, right? Yeah. And then uh, the last ones are not that. And we did that on purpose because past a certain point, okay, the lights went out, the lights came on, somebody's dead. You know what I mean? Like you, we've done that now. So <laughs> what next? And it's like, you know, especially... Um, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm trying to be vague, but it's, you know, what, what actually happened um, uh, in, in the high fantasy story, in um, uh, The Curse of, uh, wait, I got to make sure I say it right, uh, The Curse of Savignon Sunguard, Savignon Sunguard, because my mind just went Savignon Blanc, I'm like, I swear that's not the name, <laughs> you know, what actually happened there and why is something that would happen in that world whereas uh you know the wonderful world of mr robertson which is actually my my favorite one the the vaguely mr rogers inspired one yeah um that one when we were telling that story we we were saying we're like this this one's really something like this could be a play this could be a movie i mean obviously we're proud of all of them but i think we wrote that one last so i think maybe we just hit our stride enough by that point yeah. that it was like oh wow this one's cool but you know who did the killing and why in, 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 in what manner in a world where, you know, puppets have come to life, 
<laughs> is 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 a lot different, <laughs> you know, than than who does the manor at uh, who does the murder at a cult that worships Henry Winkler. I love that those are just two things that exist in the world. As one does. Hey, again, I'm like, have we checked the land of make believe? You know what I mean? Is this Lady Fairchild might just be in there chilling right now? Like, uh, <laughs> like has anyone looked? I don't know. That one. Um, that was very much what we were trying to do, though. That we were like, what? How many ways can we just take this thing and do it again? It's like, um, you know, it's almost like we agreed that we were going to be putting on a dancing show. It's like, okay, we're doing a dancing show. So we're gonna give you ballet and tap and break dancing and like moshing, you know what I mean? Even though it's all dancing. If dancing is a murder mystery, then you get all these different types of flavors and manifestations of it. And I really think there's going to be something for everyone too. I mean, obviously it'd be great if somebody were to, to enjoy all five of them. And I think you would, but it's like, maybe you don't care about a film noir detective story, but the idea of reality show contestants, uh, you know, literally and figuratively stabbing each other in the back might seem interesting. Hey, dope. Sign, come in and watch that one. That is fine. <laughs> I really find it fascinating kind of that we're getting more of this experimental storytelling. Like you have this like rise in popularity with actual play D and D you have things like this where it's, it's kind of stepping away from the traditional, like, here's a story that I'm just like, that you're just going to watch on TV and have no other real connection with. Why do you mm -hmm. think that's really started to kind of raise in popularity now versus maybe even five years ago? I think it's a combination of things. Um, and it's interesting watching this whole streaming thing uh, come along because I've been here kind of from the early, early days of it, not the earliest days, but the very early days. Um, I think it's because streaming, um, when it is done properly, um, in this I would actually apply to video game streamers as well as tabletop streamers, is when it's done well, you feel like you're there playing a game with your friends. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're there with them and everybody wants to be there and everybody's having a good time. And during the pandemic, a sense of connectedness was the thing that none of us had. So yeah. I think that's why there was this meteoric rise during this time of just something that made us feel connected to another human. You know, I think that that's definitely the top level. The second level is the experiential aspect of it. It's that, um, you know, when, when people have never played D and D or never played a tabletop game, I always explain it to them the same way. I'm like, what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite book? What's your favorite movie? How would you like to live it? You yeah. know, and it's like, ooh, you know, it's like now with things like foul play, it's you feel like you're in the room. Like it's interesting to watch, uh, you know, a, a Poirot murder. I mean, Agatha Christie is like the number one selling author for a reason. Yeah. But it'd be different if you felt like you were in the room with Poirot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's right there and I'm right here and he's, you know, letting the little gray cells work, you know? Um, and I think we're getting closer and closer to that. And they did a lot of very innovative tech work uh, with foul play to to make this possible. Um, uh, it, it's more than just uh, logging into a Zoom call. Like there's there's some technological infrastructure in place there that is really ingenious. Um, I think the closest thing I can explain to what it's like is uh, Sleep No More. If you're familiar with Sleep No More, uh, which is the it's an experimental retelling of Macbeth, more or less. Wow. But it's in this big warehouse. It's like five stories. And all five acts are happening simultaneously. Like when it start, act one starts, act two starts, three, four, and five. And it's just happening. And you can move around and listen. And like if you're there where Duncan is, then you hear what Duncan's talking about. If you're, if you're upstairs where Lady Macbeth is trying to convince uh, Macbeth to kill him, you know, then you hear that. Um, but you don't experience where you're not at, you know? Right. So obviously you could come back 10 times and you're gonna see something different every time. And I think that's uh, kind of what we managed to accomplish with foul play. Now I need to look that up because I want to do that. And that's, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the experience aspect is something that I'm really interested to see how that gets even more kind of incorporated into storytelling in the future. Cause I love like how it's happening with foul play, how it's happening with, like Twitch streamers and even the like 40X stuff where it's kind of making you feel like you're in 
the room as opposed to just sitting and watching a movie how it traditionally used to be do you yeah. think the next step is just like fully vr or do you think that there's going to be other areas to play in before we get to that point i myself am a vr enthusiast i i, I have been from from the early days of this technology with like the 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 samsung gear vr you know like i, I had those i got i got uh oculus 2 now I've, I've had a bunch of these things the issue with VR is there's a one big gap. People want the holodeck. That's what we want. We want yes. to walk into a room and I'm in it. Yeah. And there's a significant gap in technology between being able to put on a helmet and give you that, right? Mm -hmm. But people don't want the helmet, so they don't spend money on the helmet. So there's not necessarily the money in the development of the holodeck, you know? I mean, it's going to happen, like 100%. It's going to happen. But that's the that's where those things aren't quite lining up, you know? Um, I think uh, if I had to wager a guess, I think real legitimate uh, AR, altered reality, so not to throw around too much jargon for people who don't know what I'm talking about, which is uh, closer to Pokemon Go, let's say, that your, okay. your glasses will be able to project things that you'll just be out and about in the world, not doing anything special. And then Pikachu runs by, you know what I mean? And you're like, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And can react. I think that AR level is going to kick in more than a widespread adoption of VR, um, if I had to guess. But it is going to happen, like a thousand percent, a thousand percent it is going to happen. Um, what I think would be fun, what I would love to see, and I'm by no means promising, you know, but I would love to see is if this becomes popular enough to be able to do things like this live, you know, yeah. similarly, where it's everybody's there and you can see them and people break up and you follow this person or that person or interact with this person or that person. Uh, I think that kind of thing would be a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that would be fantastic i'm also honestly because i grew up like watching murder mystery stuff with my parents so i'm loving this resurgence we're having in that genre as well with things like poker face and knives out mm -hmm. but, and this takes that in a very fun silly direction and i think one of the things that threw me initially was it does not open with the murder right. you're like, waiting for a like i literally was watching and i'm like someone mm -hmm. has to get killed at some point right <laughs> like that's yep. what's going on so what was it like to kind of play with even just the regular format of it, both in the traditional like trope ones, but also the ones where it's like the Mr. Rogers and the high fantasy and reality show and all of that? It's interesting because you you get to tell a different kind of story because I've done both. I, I've I've done, um, you know, you open up standing over the body type thing. And, and, and the story is as much about who was this person Mm -hmm. and who would have had the means, motive, and opportunity to kill them type thing. Whereas with this one, you're getting to know everybody equally, and you're having to ask yourself the entire time, would that be the kind of person that would be a killer, or is that the kind of person that deserves to die? <laughs> so you're, uh, and the answer is both. <laughs> both is the answer, right. You know, but but you're weighing that the whole time and you're already getting attached to people and things so that when the when the 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 hammer falls, such as it is, um, then you're simultaneously, hopefully shocked and surprised that when the lights go out, you don't know who's going to be dead when they come up again, which, you know, hopefully is a pretty uh, exciting experience and, and more engaging because I think you've got to pay closer attention to the people when you don't know which one of them uh, is going to get got uh, than if uh, it already were like presupposed, I think. Yeah, no, I fully agree because yeah, when it, when it would get revealed, it very much, I was like, oh no, I'm sure I missed something leading to this. Let me just say, not let, let's not spoil it for anybody. You you already said you didn't figure out the 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 killer. Did you know who was going to get killed? Did you figure that out in the I, first one? That I guessed largely because it is like kind of the traditional expectation. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't something where it's like I see the clues leading to why this is. It was more like when it was revealed, I'm like, okay, I'm not surprised by that. Right. Right. There's also a very ingenious mechanic that um, when the person dies, they come back as the investigator. <laughs> I died so. when they had the, him come back as the detective. And it was like the name itself 
and that no one could get through the name. And it was just like, that to me was almost one of those moments where I'm like, I feel like I'm watching a Dungeons and Dragons actual play live stream because yep. no one is going to let this person get away with the name they chose. That was all very real, by the way. That was all very real. Yeah, that's, uh, I thought that, that was, that was a neat thing so that uh, uh, the person, they don't, they get to still be a part of the fun, you yes. know? Uh, even if they, they're, cause it's not like, it's not like the performer is meant to be punished by the fact that their character dies. So it's like, Hey, performer, you still get to come in here and have a good time. So. Yeah. I loved it. Um, for you, what do you think you would take away from this experience to bring into some of your like future projects? I really liked the nonlinear aspect of it. Um, which is, of course, uh, difficult because I, I reject linear time and all the other lies of the Jedi. But unfortunately, <laughs> there's still things, you know what I mean, where you, it has to have a beginning, middle, and end in the story that you're telling, uh, even if it can be kind of uh, uh, all over the place getting there. The idea that it's like you kind of start in one place and scatter completely and then come back together at the end. I think that's really neat. That That's a lot of fun to see play out. I'm definitely gonna be trying to figure out more ways to uh, implement stuff like that for certain. Uh, yeah, the scatter part threw me off a few times because I would be like, I'm gonna go to this room to see what they're doing. And immediately they'd run out the door and I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> That also happened to me that I was like, <laughs> wait, I was like, something's happening over there. Click. And I'm like, oh, they're done doing that thing over there. Or the person that was in this room and I click on this room and that person comes into this room now and it's like, quit following me. Stop it. What are you doing? Yeah. So, uh, but I, I, I will tell you, I will tell you, folks, pay close attention. A lot's happening at all times. Definitely. Yes. This is a show that has rewatchability, not just because it's good, but because you will miss things the first and second and third time you watch it. You just will. It's not possible to catch it all. Uh, I think I know what it would take to catch it all, but I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell, I'll tell you, but uh, we're not going to tell the people just yet <laughs> what it would take, I think, to catch it all. I love it. Oh my gosh. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about this. It's, it's so good and it's so like, I don't want to say strange, but kind of strange in like the best way. So I'm very excited for more people to watch it. It's definitely the best kind of strange. And and, and tune in, watch them all. But Mr. Robertson, the world, Mr. Robertson's world, uh, in particular, that one in particular is. Nah. I know I mean, you would think it's the D and D inspired high fantasy one. And again, good, yeah. they're all good, but the Mr. Robertson's one. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I feel like with most things, when puppets come to life, the crazy gets to the best point, though. Correct. 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 And uh, definitely uh, looking forward to see what Gaten does with his role, because that guy, I've had the, the joy of working with him when I ran D&D &D for the cast of Stranger Things, and, and he is just a human ray of sunshine. So I uh, it's interesting to see uh, how that's going to play out as a potentially murderous puppet. <laughs> <laughs>